everyone. Welcome to the fourth Art at Home talk. And thank you um, for joining us for this series. This is the final one of the summer series. Um, as many of you have been tuning into the series, you may already know Art at Home is a partnership between three Syracuse University departments, the Syracuse University Art Museum, the College of Visual and Performing Arts, and the Office of Alumni Engagement in New York City. I'm Vanya Malloy, the Director and Chief Curator of the Syracuse University Art Museum, and I'll be moderating today's program with artist Deborah Roberts. A few words about the format of today's session. I'm going to spend a few minutes introducing our speaker, Deborah, during which time her work will be shown in a loop presentation. So everyone has a chance to have a full screen view of her art. After which I'm going to ask Deborah some questions and then take some questions from the audience. Like before, this is a Zoom webinar format, which means participants are muted. So I encourage you all to submit questions that you'd like to ask through the online Q&A. And please don't wait until the end of the se se session, sorry, to submit your questions. You can do this at any time. My colleague, Emily, who's managing the back end of the presentation, she's gonna be reviewing the questions and making a selection for us to cover later in the session. Okay, so let's get started with the PowerPoint so you can all see Deborah's fabulous art. Emily's going to work on sharing that for us. Um, and as she does, I'm going to start kind of giving us a background about Deborah. So she's an artist who lives and works in Austin, Texas, and is represented by Stephen Friedman Gallery in London and Bill Metter in Los Angeles. Her work has been exhibited internationally across the US and Europe. Robert's work is in the collections of the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Brooklyn Museum, the Studio Museum in Harlem, LACMA in Los Angeles, the Block Museum of Art at Northwestern University, Blanton Museum of Art in the University of Texas at Austin, and Spelman College Museum of Art in Atlanta, among many others. She was selected to participate in the 2019 Robert Rauschenberg Residency and is the recipient of the Anonymous Was a Woman grant the Paula Krasner Foundation Grant, the Ginsburg Klaus Award Fellowship, and she received her MFA from Syracuse University, where her work won Best in Show at the MFA Show. She is currently preparing for an amazing upcoming solo show at the Austin Contemporary, titled Deborah Roberts, I'm. It's scheduled to open January 23rd, 2021, and you can check out more about the show online it's going to be fantastic and I'm super excited about it. And I think all of you should check it out. Now, as you can see from the works that are cycling through here, that there are, her work is in multimedia, mixed media, um, which uh, explores the notions of beauty, identity, and race through portraits of black children. Her art combines found materials ranging from photographs, magazines, literature, and the internet with meticulously painted detail to create whole individuals from fragmented parts as a way to tell her own story. She chooses as her subject Black children, giving attention to a constituent group who has historically, and sadly still today, is among the most vulnerable members of our society. Through her art, she draws our attention to how societal pr pressures, such as projected images of beauty and the violence of American racism, shape these young individuals, as well as shapes how others perceive them. These complex depictions of children are at once powerful and serious, at the same time vulnerable and playful. They capture our attention with their fragmented beauty and push us to think about how the society we participate in and help create shapes the lives of these innocent children. Deborah, thank you so much for joining us today. We're all very much looking forward to this conversation about your art. <laughs> and I'm personally very, very excited about it and can't wait to hear more about it. All right, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased to be back at Syracuse in a way. Yeah, well, we're pleased to have you. And I just wanted to do some housekeeping notes for all of you who are tuning in. Now, you may want to make Deborah's picture bigger so you see her better. And it's an easy way to do that. Um, I'm just going to talk you through it. And I'll also put it in the chat box so that if you miss the directions, you can follow back. But essentially, if you hover on your screen, on there's a um, kind of view options button. And you press it. It's on the very top center of your Zoom screen and you go all the way down, you select side-by-side -side mode. Um, that's what you want to click on, and then you'll be able to see the PowerPoint, 
and the presenter view, you know, Deborah and myself. Um, there will be um, on the left side of the image, uh, kind of a gray line and that you can select on and drag it. Um, and this will allow you to make the images of her work bigger or smaller and the image of Deborah bigger or smaller, depending on your preference. And you can change it at any point. So we're all learning at Zoom about Zoom as we go through this virtual world. Uh, so it's good to know, you know, for, for all these different events. But the other cool thing you can do is you can hover over her picture and on the upper right, there's these, the blue box with three dots and you can select pin um, video. And in this case, that will make sure that Deborah's image is always on your screen, that you're always seeing her. So now that, you know, I've given you all this housekeeping, I wanted to, you know, bring you back to the art. Uh, I've prepared a few questions for us to address, you know, to talk about together, Deborah. Uh, mm -hmm. But before I do, I just wanted to say, you know, I this is such a great opportunity to get to talk to you. Um, I found your work to be powerful and moving and beautiful. And I have to say, like, you know, ever since I've started kind of preparing for this presentation, getting to know your work even better, it's just like left an imprint on my mind. I keep thinking about your work. I keep thinking back on it. It's there's something that really grabs you and pulls you in. Um, and I'm so honored to get to have this conversation with you today. Well, I'm happy to be here. So uh, let's get going. All right. Well, I'll, I'll start with an easy one, which is, you know, what <laughs> made you want to be an artist? Um, actually, I don't really remember, but I know I started in the third grade. Um, I knew I was started drawing uh, little race cars and things like that. And, and I got a lot of attention for drawing which I like being one of eight children, you don't get attention unless you're really sick. So, uh, so it, was, it was really great to be able to, um, you know, start drawing and getting a lot of people wanting me to draw things for them. And I just, um, I fell in love with it and I just, I just kept going. I just kept doing the work um, until, you know, I'm here now. You know? That's great. So what, what number were you in the birth order? I'm just curious. Um, I'm, I'm number five. I'm number five, third daughter. So I, I love the number three. So <laughs> my favorite number. Yeah, middle child. My husband is one of 11. I think I mentioned wow. that to you. He's number eight of the 11. So wow. I've okay. got to learn a little bit of dynamics of big families. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so was your family encouraging? It sounded like, you know, if, if you were getting attention from your art that they encouraged it. No, I mean, not really. I mean, my, my family, you know, they didn't really understand art and how art was really um, is important. It was something that you did in school. It was a hobby, but it wasn't anything that anyone felt that you could make a living at. Mm -hmm. And so, so my father in particular was just, he was always trying to discourage me from doing it. But I always tell people, if it's in you, if this is what you want to do, no one can discourage you from doing it. So, um, so yeah, even though they, they, they wasn't like as supportive as they possibly could have been, um, they didn't tell me not to do it. But, you know, my father made jokes about it a lot. So that wasn't fun. You know? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think it's normal for parents to be concerned. The arts are a hard place to make a career, but I think it's when your heart's in it, it's worthwhile pursuing. Right, absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, when, at what point did you think, like, did you always know I want to be an artist professionally? Or um, was there something... In that happened that made you think like, wow, this is actually what I want to pursue for a living? Um, I guess when I was 18, I had a, um, uh, a show at American Bank, it was downtown Austin, and I was able to frame my work for the first time and have people come out. They had a little reception uh, right before the bank closed and people came out and I got a a lot of, you know, that away girls. And so I was really pleased by that. And I was thinking, maybe this is what I really want to do. Uh, I had no idea how to do it, but I knew I wanted to move forward in it. And so I think that was the, you know, they say the bite of the apple when you really decide, okay, this is it. I'm going to do that. So I guess when I was 18, probably. Mm -hmm. That's great. And so what, I mean, from the, did you have a clear mission in your art from the beginning or has your mission evolved? Like 
what do you want your audience to get out of your work? Well, I mean, of course, you know, the art matured as I matured, but you know, the, the new, the, the work that I did before was the black romantic. It was more like Norman Rockwell, but black, you know, the black experience, how it felt like to have two parents live in a neighborhood where everybody cared what happened to the next person. So I was, painting um, more black Americana and it was amazing. And um, so, so I wanted everybody to see that, that this is how we live, this is how we grow and love. And, but I noticed that the images I was painting in my work wasn't what was being projected on TV. So I decided, you know, to do a little research. So I realized that, um, the negative images that were showing wasn't anyone I recognized. And so I wanted to just figure out what, how was Black America being realized globally? And once I started that research, the work started to change and to grow and to uh, become a little bit more complicated. That's great. And so when you, did you always work in the collage mode or is this something you were painting before and then you began to adopt collage? I started collage at Syracuse. Um, I, the summer before um, I left San Francisco Art Institute and moved to uh, Syracuse, I started figuring out I wanted to do little girls. I did know that and I used to do them without any clothes on and, and the faces wasn't collage yet but it was my face as a little girl. And um, when I got into my graduate studies, I started adding the collage because I, I wanted to uh, create multiple faces, multiple identities in the work that this monolithic idea of blackness that I was constantly hearing there wasn't anything that I recognized. So I, uh, I started collages then and they just started working themselves out. Uh, remember uh, Peter B. Sicker was one of, I did an independent study with him and, um, and I told him I was gonna do um, 100, cause 100 seemed so many of these little girls. And he said, why not 200? I said, why not 250? You know, I was raising the stakes. And I just got in there and I really just started doing the work. And by doing so many, um, the work started to, to get better. And I wasn't aware of it. And it became a little bit more complicated. I mean, we started talking about gender and colorism and racism and all those things that, you know, I could yell out into your face and you wouldn't hear it. So how could I subtly talk about those issues and uh, bring people to the work without, you know, shaming them or blaming them, uh, but to tell them because of this, I'm now sitting here. You know, so, um, so yeah, I started just at, at Syracuse, actually. That's great. And so, I mean, you said children were, you always thought, you know, young girls at first, but children. What made you think children is the immediate subject? Well, you know, one of the things I saw with uh, my contemporaries, um, well, no one, when we talk about Black women, everybody was talking about grown-up women. Mm -hmm. But my idea was to couch my argument and this notion of how do we come to women that we are today? When do the gloves come on? When do we start fighting for our own identity? And it was a lot earlier than I thought. At first, I thought it was 15, 16. And then I said, no, if I look back on my life, when I first decided that you know, I wanted something different. I wanted my hair done different. I wanted different clothing. I wanted different shoes. That, and it was around eight, around seven, eight, and nine. And I, those when I was making those first independent choices to how I was going to enter the world. And so I decided that would be the space I would start creating these collages from that space. And is that, does clothing then play a role in how, because I noticed there's a lot of beautiful patterns and, you know, details in the clothing that you're, you use in your collages. Is that something that you're thinking about in terms of that choice and that personal identity? No, not, I really didn't think about clothing until I came home for a break. And I was at a food chain store here, um, you know, getting some groceries or something. I saw a little girl around the same age that I, I do my collage and she had the most crazy outfit. I knew no one but her put that together. 
And I said, that's it. That is when you, I mean, I was right. That's when you make those choices. So what I started to do when I got back to Syracuse is start adding these crazy clothes, putting these patterns with stripes and, and, and polka dots and all sorts of things together as if this is somebody deciding how they're going to, how they're going to dress, you know, what they think at their eight year old self looks really good. And so I started thinking about textures and, and color theory and things like that. And that brought me into, um, the notions of art history, you know. Um, I tell people always that my work has a four-pronged approach. It is art history, American history, black culture, and pop culture. All those things exist in my work at, at, at one time. And, and so I just added the pop culture references um, and the political, the art history. It, it's just, it works all together. That's amazing. And I know we talked a little bit about your time at SU doing your MFA and being at a university setting, how you had access to all these different departments. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, about interdisciplinary kind of research and kind of spanning outside of just the MFA program to educate your work? Right, right. And you know, when I got there, uh, you know, I knew I didn't do any type of work with any of the professors, but you know, I had been the first African American uh, student there in 35 years. So I knew I had to go right away to African American studies to 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 help me, you know, break this work, unpack this work. Um, I went over to um, over. It was right next to Schaefer, uh, African American Studies Department, and I went to talk to Dr. Ruffin, uh, Dr. Ken Willard. I mean, just a lot of people talking about the type of work. Come in my studio, look. I went to Art Ed, talked to Dr. Sharif Bay. Uh, I went over to uh, Illustration, um, you know, y Yvonne Buchanan and uh, James Ransom. I just got different people uh, looking at my work, uh, telling me different things when I wanted to add text to it or something more flatter. I went talk talked to Dusty and printmaking. And, you know, I took an intensive with Holly. Just you know, building my, the program that I needed to be successful because, you know, it's easy to go into a graduate program and go down a little hole and get stuck there and not be able to work your way out of it and have so many voices. Uh, my, me being older, I knew what I wanted from this work. I knew who my audience was. And I think that was very important. And I remember saying that a lot, you know, this is not my audience. I know where my audience is and I have to work toward that. And I just did and it worked out for me. That's great. Yeah, no, I think it really comes through in your work that it's informed from all these different areas. And I'm wondering if you could talk a bit more, you mentioned that you use text in some of your work. Um, had, did you always do that or is that something you, you started to do after your, or during your MFA? Um, and how have you used it? What, what made, what drew you to that? Right. I, I started to text after, well, I started a little bit, you know, those final months when we were finishing up, I started doing some text-based work, some recipes, how to create a black woman, um, things like that. And, uh, the text didn't really come out really good into 2016 when I was doing um, black sounding names. I, I wanted to um, do these names up in a text-based work. And I remember talking to my good friend and I was telling her um, these were funny names and I was gonna make a funny thing out of it. And she, she's like, wait a minute, you know, you can't do that. These are, these are black cultural names. These are, since slavery was the first time black people were able to, to name their own children. And this is an act of independence. This is something that we should celebrate. So I started to uh, think about that. And so I, I gathered up a whole bunch of names, did a lot of research, um, got them in the computer, started typing them out. And, and then I looked up and all of them had little red lines underneath it. I mean, the one thing to tell us what's right and wrong was Webster. And it was saying something was wrong with all these names that they were not correct. And I said, that's the work. I remember thinking, this is the work, you know? And then I built from that. And I called it sovereignty and pluralism, that this duality, that what is sovereignty? I mean, who gets to be sovereign, a sovereign person in a country? 
So um, the text just worked from that. It created its own audience, you know. Um, I don't necessarily know. I mean, when my work sale, when I have new text, I mean, both the text and the collage sale, I don't do a lot of the text, but the text pieces have their own audience. Um, it's, it's more cerebral. Uh, it takes more time. Um, it, it is definitely not in your face. It, you have to work for it, and I love it. I love text when it works. Sometimes it doesn't work, you know. But it sounds so powerful. I mean, what you're describing, how none of the names are all underlined as, as if they're all wrong. Um, and, and it is something that, you know, it, all these passive ways in our society that you're kind of, the people mm -hmm. are made to feel like they don't fit in, you know, that yeah. they're not right. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that I feel like people who go there through their whole lives who don't experience it, don't even think about. Um, yeah, I certainly, I know that experience because every time I type Vanya, it tells me it's wrong too. <laughs> uh, but right. yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it is yeah. something that, you know, for those of us who have that issue, it, it's mm -hmm. frustrating and it does but, get... So your name is culturally specific to an area, right? Yeah. So if you are, um, you know, like, you know, born here in America and, you know, black culture, when you create this name, these, these, these powerful names, you know, a lot of people have to, you know, abbreviate the names now, or, I mean, you know, now we have Keisha, Keisha Lance Bottoms, who is, you know, uh, the mayor of Atlanta. Then we had, you know, Barack Obama, who had a daughter named Natasha, you know, so, so, so when these names are created in black culture, um, your name is never ghettoized or never class, you know, it's a class issue that that person must be black automatically. Mm -hmm. You know, your name is Sharkezia, Tawana, then you're black. You know, you, you, you don't have to be black, but people assume that you're black. So that's, the, that's what I was doing with the work is that this, this idea of your name is Apple. You know, you're not going to expect a black person to walk through the door named Apple, but you would not automatically discard her job, job application. Mm -hmm. So, but if my name is Tawana and it's on a job application, you're more likely to say, and if I have the same qualifications as Apple, Apple may get ahead than me, you know, but so that's. You're right. Mm -hmm. And, and Deborah, not only that, I know I read this, this is years ago now, but I think it was. Harvard that did a pretty interesting study about professors answering emails of students. Right. And if they showed, if, if they identify the name as black, then there is a much lower rate of response of even getting a response from your professor. Right. And the same was also for female. If you're a woman, it's like also lower. Um, but, you know, as a black woman, it would be the worst. And that was just crazy to see because you would think for faculty, you know, especially in a place like, I mean, Harvard did the study. I don't know if they were looking at Harvard specifically, but um, it's, it's really disappointing because from faculty, you would expect a lot more. Right. Well, yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, we should. We should, talk about right? they should. They should be setting a good example. Yeah, they um, yeah. So, I mean, that's, it's definitely true. Um, and so I wanted to ask you more about your process. I mean, I'm looking at these images. Emily, they stopped scrolling for me. I don't know if that's something you could fix. Um, but I wanted um, to see, you know, that uh, the thing that strikes me about them, when I look at them, I mean, I think they're, they're stunning. And they're, there's something about kind of almost like enigmatic about it, where you're trying to figure out what, what I'm, tr I'm looking at them and I'm thinking like this one here that with the other set of hands, and the poses, you know, I'm trying to uh, think about what you're telling me through the works. Um, and what I love is the detail of the hands. If, for me, the hands feel especially significant with the different gestures, with the way that they're posed together within this mm -hmm. kind of boxing gloves. And I'm wondering for, for hands, is that something that, you know, you think a lot about um, when you compose these works? I do. I have a folder just full of hands that when I look at a different type of person's hands and I really like it from from Swiss Biss son to uh, President Obama. I have Muhammad Ali's fist. Um, I have, um, you know, uh, 
Oakley's. I mean, I just have different, if I love hands, I, I've always loved hands. I always felt like that was my most difficult thing to paint when I was painting hands. So, so in this work in particular with this one right here, uh, that's Muhammad Ali's fist that's, you know, powering through. Um, I, I do a lot of work because the hands are important. Um, they are the way that you can greet someone with an open hand or a closed hand. I talk about those ideas that there's no room to grow with a, with a closed hand. Um, so, so those things, those symbols, those tropes in the work are very important. Like this kid, he's carrying all these, these black faces. He's holding them close to him as he walked and look, you know, very childlike. Um, that's important. This one has Rosa Parks hands, uh, uh, James Baldwin, Muhammad Ali, all in one motion. And then she's also pledging, you know, with her left hand. Um, this one uh, by Barack Obama's hand and this one in James Baldwin. So it's yeah. great. I mean, I find it amazing. I would never have known that there's a specific individual people's hands that, that you're using. Right. Well, it's that pop pop culture part of it, which I use icons, different types of icons in the work. I've done Rihanna, uh, I mean, James Baldwin a lot. I need to stop actually doing James Baldwin. But, you know, it's so weird that I do, I talked about this yesterday. James Baldwin, his writing is so important. And he, he wrote this thing 50, 60 years ago, and it's so relevant today. We could just hold on to those words and move them out. That's really what I want for my practice is that in 60 years, hopefully we're not going through the same issues, but it's something that is relevant that people can say, this is an artifact of that time. Deborah was creating these works based on that. You know, we, at one point, you know, that was an issue with classism. That was an issue with racism. And she was, this is what she was talking about, you know, like J, uh, Jonathan Atlas shirt on in that piece. And um, I have some, um, just different artists' works are in the works. No artists in this piece, though. But um, I, I do, um, you know, like men who are various abstract artists, you know, who were very successful. Um, they are in my work. And when there were women doing those same things and didn't get any type of attention. Mm -hmm. so, so art history is important, and that's American history. And, um, and then there's also Black history, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, one of the other things I noticed, and I, uh, I'm sure that, you know, this is very intentional, is the eyes. Yeah. Uh, the details in the eyes, it seems like that's something you, you paid a lot of attention to, and how sometimes the same one figure can have, you know, different eyes. Mm -hmm. um, is that, similarly, are you taking images of, of people that, you know, the cultural icons or people that you know in, in these works? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, eventually I'm moving away from it because I got, I did a show in New York and uh, everybody was trying to guess who was in the work. I didn't want that. You know, I, I want to have those things important as part of the work, but I need you to see the overall piece. So, uh, yeah, I have, oh my God, Kendall Lamar. I think that's Kendall Lamar's um, face, eye in that piece. Uh, a lot of James Baldwin. Um, um, Rihanna, of course, like I said, Janet Jackson, um, Missy, um, Missy Elliott, um, Misty Copeland. I mean, I have a lot of people's faces in my work. Um, this one in particular is um, Sidney Poitier's face. Um, and this is the piece I think looks most like Ramir Beard and that one that just passed. And if we go back one, um, when I did this piece right here, uh, when I put the face together, because I normally put the face together first. I'm sorry, Alexa might start talking. Um, when I put the uh, faces together before I do the body, I said, oh my God, this really looks like Romeo Bearden. And, and, and I try not to let my work be that when I have the, you know, over exaggerated faces disproportionate to the, to the other face. But this was, you know, I added a red piece of paper. Um, I thought, and then the type of hat I put on it that dated it, I really felt this was a beautiful um, rendering that if anyone said my work really looked like Ramir Beard and this is where it would make lie in. But uh, I, again, I used the Jonathan Adler design and the shirt. I moved the, uh, I moved the proportion where the kid is stretching with, um, you know, 
Ali's hand and and I want the eyes of the people of my images to look you directly in the face. You know, when I was growing up, I didn't do that a lot and I still don't at times, but I think that you have to meet people where they are and sometimes you have to look them directly in their faces in order for them to see your humanity, which is what I'm trying to do in the work anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, this particular piece, I, I totally love. Um, it's great, I mean, I, yeah. It's a stunning piece. And, you know, you mentioned some of the, you know, some of the figures have been important, like girls in the beginning of your work, right? And here right. you're expanding. Is that a something you did more recently, expanding it to boys as well? Mm -hmm. I actually didn't start boys until 2018. Okay. Um, so many people were asking me because they said boys have, you know, very similar, uh, even worse issues than girls. And, you know, I don't think it could be any worse. Um, um, but um, I started with the works of George Stinney. Uh, he was a little 14 year old boy who was wrongly convicted of murder and two little white girls in um, 1944. And that piece is in here, Emily, it's the little boy with the stripes and his feet are crossed. Um, it's Nisam Dorma. Um, he was wrongly for convicted. 70 years later, he was exonerated. He, he did not, uh, this only crime was to say, uh, I saw them that day. And that was it. Automatically, someone had to pay for their deaths and it was him. It was no way he could have packed their bodies uh, all the way across um, a big field. Uh, he was right here. He was 80 days. He was, um, he was too little, too small. He had no shoes. Uh, his, foot, he, his feet would have showed some type of uh, damage um, and uh, they didn't. Uh, but he was tried and convicted. Well, he was tried in, I think, an hour, three days, actually three days, and then he was convicted in 10 minutes. And he served, he was, he was uh, electrocuted, um, I think a day or two days before his 15th birthday. A total of 80 days. Yeah. So I started working with this kid's image and um, and I, I started with the boys from here and a jumping off point and um, I just started working through, I don't know what it's like to be a male, uh, the issues that they are facing. I know that they are stopped tremendously by the police. They are, um, this idea of they're criminalized very early. Um, this is notion of schoolhouse to jailhouse and things like that. That's what I wanted to talk about. And, and my, my uh, entry into boys, uh, toxic, toxic masculinity, I wanted to talk about those issues. And uh, this, this piece, I mean, I wanted a lot for this work for George Denny and uh, this work is hanging in the National Gallery in, in uh, Washington, DC. So more people understand about him. Um, I did eight, of these works, and I think five are in uh, institutions, which is perfect. You know, his story would get out more. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so powerful, and I'm just thinking about everything that's been going on recently: with Black Lives Matter, the protests, mm -hmm. I mean, all the police killings of innocent people, uh, innocent Black men in particular, and women, right. um, and children. I mean, so I'm just thinking: how has that? everything going on recently how has that informed your work or has it you know i've talked to other artists who said i can't make any work right now um because it's just too much um but you know i'm wondering if you feel similarly or if it's inspired you to do new work it is too much it really is and at times it really gets to me i can't uh, do social media because it's just so much but art has always been um my my safety zone is a place that I could go and heal myself, my mental self, and uh, so I use this time to to finish up my work for my Austin show. But just to you know, I became I was very prolific. You know, I I discussed earlier um, this week how I used to, had to go to the studio at five thirty and I create a lot of work before you know they will start wondering why you were out when we were in total lockdown. Um, so, so yeah, it's been, uh, I, but I'm tired, you know, I've done the last work for this year. I can't do any more. I've spent, uh, but it was, 
it was important to do work. And the last five works that I did address the unrest and 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 people's lives being taken, like Breonna Taylor, were just simply living their lives. And so um, I did work through that, but it, it's so much that that road would never get paved. So I I can work on this for the rest of my life and two lifetimes. Yeah. Yeah. It's unfortunate. It's it's yeah, it is. But I think that's why your work is so important too, because it brings these issues to the forefront and it does it in such a way that it's beautiful. I mean the works are beautiful, but it engages in such powerful content. Um, and it's it's a dialogue for discussion, which is what we really as a country need more of. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, you talked a lot about how you were drawn first to the female body, right? To right. the girls. And I didn't even know you mentioned that at first they were, they were nude, right? And yeah. then you started to add clothing um, and you used yourself, um, your face and parts of it. Um, I'm just curious, you know, what, you know, as a, I think it's really wonderful to have a woman artist depicting a to female body, right? A girl right. body or adult woman body. Because if you look, I mean, I think it's the gorilla girls who have said something. There's, they have that slogan. It's like, I forget how many nudes there are in, especially an art museum. And it's like, I forget the percentage, but it's, it has some high 90 some percent are done by men, right? Um, and so to have a woman's voice in the museum is so important. Um, but also it deals with your work, I think, for when I look at it, it brings up a lot of things that girls are dealing with now, um, right. being with popular culture um, and these perceptions of beauty um, that are very, um, can be very devastating, honestly. Right. Um, and so I would love to hear more about your thoughts about this when you approach your work. Right. Well, it's this idea. I mean, I think the Washington Post did an uh, article that says little black girls are less, a scene less innocent than little white girls. All girls are innocent until you, you're able to voice what can and cannot be done to you or your body. And um, so when I first did the drawings of my my face on a little girl new body that, that I created, I definitely did not have a model. Um, and I remember this guy came in and he told me, he said, oh, you're going to be in trouble for that. And it was, it was quite funny because I was, it wasn't funny, but I was like, why? He said, you know, that's, here's this nude body and, um, and it's a little girl. And I said, I understand that. I said, but they have, they have literally stripped us of all dignity at times and have shown us to be, the, the the mule of society and we cannot carry the load all the time that there is no more and so I worked through all of that work and eventually got to the collages but I have those works that I'm gonna put out there but it you know people black bodies are so sexualized and women's bodies are so sec sexualized that you almost don't want to feed into that that frenzy, that notion of having a yet another body that I need to talk about, but I have to wade through all these other things for them to see this child as a child. So I've had to kind of put that work on the back burner and not push it out further. Um, I don't know if we're in a time or um, a place uh, in society where I can bring those works out and really have a general discussion about this. Um, there are some of my own wallpaper that all the black bodies that have been, you know, pushed in that are not seen. They are, they are present, but they have not been seen in, in, in white society. And so they're, they're pushed up against that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's so very important. But like I said before, there's so many issues um, to talk about and, uh, and so many different pathways in order to talk about these works. I have to figure out what is the best way, what are, I mean, what are the four things I need to talk about right now? What are the three things that are very important? And, and visibility is one of them. So that's at the, at the top of my list right now. So I've kind of taken away this idea, although I, I, I kind of visited a little bit in uh, My Body, Your Rules, a piece that I did uh, 
uh, last year, but, um, but, you know, I'll get back to it. It's just, it's so much um, to do, you know, out there. But visibility, I agree, is so important. And that's why getting right. works in public collections, you know, it's, it's makes such a difference. Um, for one, you know, to encourage these dialogues and these discussions, but the other, you know, to have representation uh, right. in the museum. I think that's so important. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I even told both my galleries that I, I wanted to prioritize museums over just selling to individual people because, you know, that's where people are going to go and see the work and someone who needs to be inspired by something I've done, or I could be that seed for them to take it further, to, to, to say, okay, I was inspired by Ramir Beard and, and, I, and Hannah Hulk, I, can, I did this stuff. And now somebody can say this, I can have been inspired by Deborah Robinson Hannah Hulk, and I did this. So they moved it forward. And, and the only way sometimes you can do that is by having works in museums where little kids come and visit and see the work. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, that's something Emily and I have been talking a lot about the museum. It's like, we need to represent our entire community in the collection. And if right, absolutely. our collection is like 90% white men, I'm not saying it is, but I think it's a high number. That's a problem. I mean, right. like the problem in when you use the collection to teach from it, if you're only seeing one perspective and it's a problem mm -hmm. when someone walks into the museum and they don't feel represented in the collection and they don't right. feel part of it or like welcome right. to be in there in that space um and so i think it's it's a really um important role of the museum to address that um and it's not a problem that's just specific to us i think it's specific to a lot of art museums um so i think this is really exciting to get your work shown and to get it in these collections and to change to create change in that way right. um and so, you know, I have a few other questions, but I'm looking at the time and I know we have some questions from the audience. So um, if those of you who are interested in asking anything, submit them and we'll get to them in a minute. But I wanted to ask you, I, I know you got, is it true you got a new studio space? Right, I'm actually, I'm building a new studio space okay. and we just, um, we just actually just poured the concrete. So I'm still, I'm still, uh, there's still time, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm gonna still have two spaces though. I'm going to uh, uh, have a one where I do works on paper and shelf screening. A uh, shelf screening is, is kind of dirty. It's just, you know, you get works all over, you don't need any, um, $80,000 works hanging on the wall and you look up and there's black paint all at the bottom of it. That's, that's not very good. So I want to do, I want to have a space where I, I do a concentration of works on canvas and panel and then a space where I do works on paper and still screening. And like I said, it's, I haven't done text work since 2016. I've done some new works for the show. It takes a lot of time and attention and I can't have the noise of, of, of the seductiveness of, should say, of the canvases calling me, you know, come over here, work on us. And um, so I think with two different spaces, I can um, kind of figure this stuff out a little bit better. That's great. And you can't, I mean, you have some works that are really big scale, right? Large scale. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Do you think with the with the studio space, you're going to continue doing like the bigger scale works there? Or? I am. I think. I think uh, the bigger canvases. Uh, I want to get a little bit more detail. I want. I want to fracture these works up. Um, uh, something um, that is not in these works that happened during COVID with the work uh, that I really can't talk about. But it. It. Uh, the work has always been under this white gaze of of identity and something happened um, to the works while I was creating them that you will see in January, you know? Um, and, and I was really surprised by that. And I need to do more of that. Um, you know, I am a painter by nature and, um, and it's so seductive and mixed media. I mean, there's rules to painting and, and doing the mixed media, you want to break those rules and do other things. And, but, you know, like the, the piece right here, red, white, and blue, I told them this is a work I did. And I said, I cannot have 80% of it painted. 80% of this is painted and very little of it is collage. That's not mixed media. And so this was the work I, I said, we can't do that. 
And so I always make collage, there's more collage elements in the work, a little bit more drawing, a little bit painting, all those, I mean, I started putting buttons and different things in the work to make it mixed media. But this work in particular was the piece that I had to say that we cannot have so much painted. This is, all of this, most of this is painted. I mean, all, most, I mean, almost all of it's painted, you know? Just a few things that are collaged in there. Huh. Yeah. That's great. That's yeah. A beautiful work. I, you know, one, you mentioned COVID, and I know I didn't ask you specifically about that. I'm just wondering, how has that impacted your work, or has it, the social distancing, you know, staying away from people? Um, you know, it, I think it's changed a lot of our lives in a very dramatic way. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if it's caused you to kind of think about your work differently or to do anything differently than usual with your work. Um, it has. Um, it changed the work. Um, it's telling an interesting story. I mean, you know, right now I'm preparing for the show in Austin, so I can't really give too much of that work away. Um, but um, something happened in the work, that's all I can tell you. And it's, it, let's just say it started to take up more space. And, um, and it became a little bit more painfully for some reason, but not in the sense what I just talked about, but it came in in the spaces it needed to come in. And, um, and I, I applied a little bit more texture to the work than I had before. Uh, and, and people would be able to see that. Um, you know, they'll kill me if I keep talking about the show because they want people. I don't know if we can, yeah. I think it had something to do with me being in a coma and it, it slowed the work down. I was able to solve a couple of problems I was having with works on paper. So, yeah. That's great. Um, yeah. And I'm just, you know, I, you know, I'm thinking about um, as well about, have you thought a lot about the youth? I mean, how children in particularly are being impacted by COVID. This right. Right. Not being able to socialize with one another, being kept away from school. I mean, the, you know, you read about in the news, like people who had problematic home situations, it's gotten so much worse for them. Right, so absolutely. There, you know, a place of support and kind of some regular structure for them, and they haven't had access to it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, you know, I, like that crosses my mind too, looking at um, the images you're showing and then thinking about what's happening with the children right now without, without that support. Um, right. and, and the arts too, you know, museums, you know, with all our public um, programs for students and we're trying to do a lot virtually, but even in Syracuse, I, I was very surprised to hear this, uh, but maybe I shouldn't have been. It's like 50% of households don't have access to, to reliable internet. I know it's a problem. It should be free internet. It yeah. be, if we're having a national emergency, and we, we are, internet should be free. It should be free for everyone so that people can, so that the, the learning process and the learning, I mean, it's not some people are achieving and others are not achieving because they don't have access. So internet should be, until this rural health issue is solved, internet should be free. And they need to figure out a way to get people computers operation operating computers so the kids can learn because if people don't do the things we need them to do we're going to be here for a couple of years you know so i think internet should be free i i feel for people because i always felt like as an artist that my art suffered in the summer because i didn't have access to the school and the materials and the teacher and the learning and so when I got home, no one cared about art. So I just used to work on newspaper and anytime paper bags and things like that that my mother was using to create to create work. I think I, I fell behind because of that. So I can understand what it has to do with actual school work with, with lunch programming and all those things. And um, it's, it's just really sad, you know. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and, you know, we're hopeful, you know, that things will get better soon, of course, but, you know, who knows? No one knows what's going to happen. Right. Um, so I have, there's a question from the audience that Emily's tagged for us to, to address, so I'm going to read it. Um, the question says, at this moment, with many of us fighting against anti-Black racism, are there particular pieces of your art that you want us to look at again more deeply? 
Oh God. I mean, you know, one of the things I talked with um, Zoe Watley yesterday was that the work is so palatable that um, it, it's easy to take in. You know, um, you know, this piece allied with power. Um, you know, there are so many works that I've done that that have I tell people it has the medicine in it that people are just low by the um either the simplicity of it or the 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 childlike beauty and looking at children that they don't see the medicine that I'm giving in the work. Um God, um, this in particular piece that's at the um, Virginia Museum, Let Them Be Children, is one that I I think is 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 so um, relevant. Just let these kids exist. I can talk about one right here, Ghost Gun, the one, Emily, the one that says Ghost Gun. I did that in relation to Tamir Rice, um, not being allowed to get any verbal commands to put the gun down. And he was a toy gun. And so I have this little kid whose shirt is being ripped apart. He's, you know, he has his little red, white, and blue, a uh, little pellet guns. And it's a, it's a Nerf gun. It is not anything that could really seriously hurt anyone. But yet, if he's his skin is black and he looks manly, and I wanted to put a, a, a actual pacifier in his mouth to say that this is a child, this is a baby. It's no way he, he can really hurt you. If and it, and it has real, um, no, I think I drew these buttons, although they look real, but um, he can't hurt you. And if he would have just got, got the verbal commands to drop the gun, go to the ground, put, or put your hands up. I wonder they shot this kid in eight seconds. So I think this piece in particular and all the works, except the George Stanley work is really important because you have to give people a chance to live. You have to. And, you know, I'm not telling uh, police officers to take all these crazy chances, but damn, it was a little 12 year old boy playing cops and robber or whatever, a gangster. Even if he's playing gangster, it doesn't matter. He was 12 and it was a toy gun. He never got any verbal commands to drop it. So, so I guess, you know, yeah, there's a couple of pieces I want people to look at. Like I said before, my, my body, your rules. If you look closely at that work, there are white hands going to her legs, going between her legs, and they have on like business suit, like you can see the cuff link, the white shirt of a legislator, you know, opening her up. And uh, it talks about, you know, the, the, the types of laws that are created by men for women. And so, yeah, there's a lot of things hidden in the work you just got to look for. Absolutely. And I, I, when I was preparing for my questions for you, the one thing that really struck me um, was how you made the comment that, you know, being black is, is global, you know, and um, how you chose um, to, you know, take some images of children from Haiti and from Africa um, to, you know, and that was a point that you were trying to make. Um, I think that's such a powerful thing too, to think, you know, that, you know, the color of our skin, I mean, people want to um, just assume you're from one place, but it's, it's, it is global and to just right. pigeonhole anyone is, is ridiculous, honestly. Right. Right. Um, but the works you do with children, I mean, in this one in particular, I mean, it really gets my heart because, you know, you can't as, for me, I'm a mother and I just see like a little boy, right? Right, it's a little like, boy. It brings, like you were saying, the, the humanity to, of it to the table. It makes people connect with this subject, this horrendous, you know, subject in a, in a very, um, in, in my case, maternal way, or you're thinking. Right, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It's like, it's crazy. Um, but I think it drives that point home really strongly. Um, and that's the power of it. So we have, um, it's almost time for us to, to end, but we have one more question from the audience. And this one says, I think it was Minor White who said all portraits are self portraits. What do you think of that statement? I agree. <laughs> I knew I, you know, when I did the, um, uh, the images of my myself as a little kid, uh, when I started this work, um, I never thought that was me. Even though it was me, I knew it was me. 
But I thought who I was today and who that little girl was, was two different people, two different people. And it turned out to be that actually was me. And I've worked my way back to even accepting all the challenges that I had at that time. So you're right. I think there's some, some of me in all this work. Um, something that I've gone through, something that I experienced, something I wanted to talk to. Sometimes when I was silent and I should have been more vocal. Uh, I think that exists in this work. That's, yeah, it's a really wonderful observation. I mean, Deborah, this has been amazing. Your work is such an inspiration. You are such an inspiration. Well, thank um, you. I'm so proud that you're an SU alum. And <laughs> so proud that we got to do this event with you. Mm -hmm. And I'm very, very much looking to your, forward to your show in January. Fantastic. Thank you. I mean, I hope uh, that you can come. We're going to have a three-day party if we can uh, um, get together, you know, we get able to, you know, socialize without mask on. I doubt it. But if you're welcome to come, we're going we're gonna to really celebrate this thing. If I can make it, I'll be there. And let me, before I, I let you go, one more question for all the students who are watching. What's your advice to students who want to pursue a career in the arts? Well, first of all, believe in your work and don't let anyone tell you that the work is any, that is not very good. Um, you know, people can critique your work, they can critique the, um, you know, what the colors look like, you know, uh, the background isn't working, whatever that, the aesthetics of the work. But you have to believe in the work. And that's one thing I came to Syracuse with. I believed in the work and I did not let anybody tear that work down. Uh, I always kept building it up and I got people, like-minded people who understood what I was talking about to come into my studio. I mean, that's on you if you don't do that because no one graduate program can get you, give you everything you need. And also get on social media, get on Instagram, uh, do hashtags, painting, drawing, mixed media, contemporary art, um, and just art. All those things get you to uh, curator sites. Um, you get on their little you know, feed and they get to see your work. You know? You're in Syracuse. It's, not, it's, not, it's a long way from New York, believe it or not. Um, I thought I would be going every weekend. Of course I did. Uh, but you just have to believe in yourself and seek out many voices. You're at a major university, you know? That's excellent advice. And I love the hashtag thing. I feel like I learned a lot from you about that too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, it's work. I, I can't tell you how, well, now I have curators following me, but before I did, you know, before I didn't, you know, I chased it, uh, Carter Foster when he was at the Whitney Museum, I chased him like, you know, I wanted to marry him. So, so, <laughs> you know, so I paid. Yeah, he's like, hey. chasing you, so it all worked out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, he's in Austin now, so it's great. Yeah. So thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I feel like I'm back without the snow. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> well, the advantages of Zoom, right? Right, um, right. This has been wonderful. I'm so glad we connected, and I'm hoping that we can stay in touch and maybe do something together in the future again. All right, fantastic. Yes, please do. I All right. Hope you in January at your show. All right. Come, please. All yeah. right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye, Deborah. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks. Bye.